Hello, welcome to Minor Murderers. I'm your host, Tracy Perger. This is episode two. First, I'd like to thank a few people for becoming monthly donors to the show. Trey in Nashville, Tennessee, my mom, and our producer, Donald. Thank you so much for all of your support. If you're interested in supporting us, please visit the donation page at MinorMurderers.com. We received some feedback on the Centoya Brown case that we'd like to share. Here's our producer, Donald, with that. Hi, everyone. We received some messages on Facebook. Jared from Washington said, My girlfriend is all crazy on the subject, the opposite of me. I think when you approach a dude and have sex with him for money and then murder him, you lose your ability to play the victim card. Andy from Maryland said, She murdered that man while he was sleeping. If she was a victim at all, it was her pimp who victimized her. We also received a voicemail. Hi, this is Chris calling from Toronto. I just wanted to call about uh, the episode that you had done on Santoya Brown. And uh, I just want to start off first off by saying good job on keeping it unbiased. Uh, I didn't really know too much about the case beforehand, so it was kind of good to really hear an un- unbiased you know, um, account of it. Um, with that said, really, I just want to say that I personally, I don't really think that she should have necessarily been found guilty, although nobody can really dispute that she did do the crime. Um, she had, she herself admitted to it. But uh, I think that the reason why I say this is because I think that, um, as was stated in the podcast, the defense didn't really do a great job at presenting her background, which I think could have had a massive impact on presenting what her state of mind was in the situation. Because as the situation was, we don't entirely know everything that happened that night, obviously, because there was two parties involved and one of them is dead at this point here um but also with her background that would have sort of put her state of mind with her age um as well as the fear that she had that cut was going to kill her um or possibly her mother which i I think i think that that would have a massive impact on uh, on her decision making uh and i think that if they had taken that more into account that possibly i think that that the decision to find her guilty as an adult, especially as an adult, um, I think that that would have been much different. As for her reporting the murder, uh, I think that that simply would lead back to her eval stating that she needed some sort of attention. Maybe she wanted to be known that she wouldn't be harmed anymore, that she wouldn't put up with anything. And, and I think that there will be some people that would probably argue that you know, we've all had terrible situations in our life that we didn't kill someone, but I don't think that you can really say that until you walk that mile in someone else's shoe. Again, I really think that the background would have been an important piece to have presented a whole lot better um, if they wanted to defend her properly. Maybe we could say that maybe she should have still been, you know, tried and, and uh, found guilty as a minor, um, but I definitely don't think that as, a, as an adult that that was the right decision to make. Um, but I do want to pose a question to you. Uh, do you think that the outcome would have been the same if she had been tried as a minor and it had been kept as that, or if she had been found not guilty? Uh, do you think that she would have had uh, the opportunity to continue down the same path as she had, or as, as she has followed, or if she would have stayed on the path that she was on? Um, you know, currently what we're seeing is that you know she's had the opportunity to get her GED. Um, as well as further education uh, to become the person that she's claiming to be. Thank you for your time. That's a great question, Chris. I never really thought about that. If she was found not guilty, she would have been released immediately. If she was found guilty but tried as a juvenile, she would have been released when she was 19. Since she had already done time in juvenile and then went back to her bad behavior as soon as she was released, I don't know if she would have benefited from that. So maybe being tried as an adult, sentenced to life in prison, and then given clemency was a blessing in disguise. Thank you for contributing your thoughts. To join the conversation, visit our website for our exclusive forum or links to our social media and our phone number. Let's begin the Jamari and Lawhorn case. I have to preface this case with a warning. There will be descriptions of child abuse, so if that bothers you, you may want to skip some parts. (laughs) 
Imagine that you are 12 years old. Your life is horrible. You've tried to get help in many different ways, and nothing seems to work. You've told your teachers. You have even told a Child Protective Services caseworker about how your parents treat you. You're at the end of your rope. You don't know what else to do, but you know you cannot live another day in that house. That was the point that Jamarian Lawhorn was at on August 4th, 2014. It was a beautiful summer day in Kentwood, Michigan, a suburb of Grand Rapids. School was set to begin the following week. Jamarian saw some other boys playing in their yard at the Pinebrook Village Mobile Home Park. He introduced himself and suggested that they go to the playground. The three young boys, nine-year-old Connor Verkirke, seven-year-old Cameron Verkirke, and their unidentified friend took off running with their new playmate. The four played on the playground for about 20 minutes before Connor fell off the slide. As he was pulling himself up to his feet, all of a sudden his new friend Jamarion was on him, stabbing him in the back with a knife that he had taken from the kitchen in his home and hidden in the sand. Connor screamed. Cameron ran over to his big brother. Jamarion ran off. The unidentified friend ran off. Cameron put his arm around Connor, helped him up, and did everything in his power to half support, half carry his dying brother home. They got up onto the porch, and their parents heard Cameron screaming as he pulled Connor up the steps. Their father, Jared, ran out and saw his sons covered in blood. He yelled to his wife, Danny, to grab something to stop the bleeding. She grabbed a shirt, which was the first cloth she saw, and ran out to join her husband and her sons on the porch. One of the neighbors came running and said that she had called 911. Just a few minutes later, another neighbor said she too had called 911. Around that same time, another 911 call came in. When the operator asked the caller what was happening, the caller replied in a calm voice, I just stabbed someone. The operator then asked, Who was it that you stabbed? To which Jamarian replied, I don't know. I'm fed up with life. The operator, trying to figure out what was going on, said, Did you stab yourself? Jamarian said, No. I did take some pills to try to kill myself. I want the police to come and lock me up forever. Take me to juvenile. I don't want to be on this earth anymore. Kill me. The operator tried to ask Jamarian questions. Jamarian told the operator that he didn't know who he just stabbed and that he threw the knife in the grass. He then began to get anxious. Hurry up. Hurry up. Why? What, what are you doing? The person just came. They're going to they try to beat me. They're going to try to beat me. So hurry up and come kill me or take me to jail. Do something. And deck me how you do on movies. Give me an electric tray. I don't care how I die. Just in the way. Okay. All right. What do you, who is who's there with you? Who did you ask the address of? Some man. Come for what? me. Who did you ask the address to? Who was that guy? Excuse me. Can I get your name? Quinn. Quinn? Yep. Okay. Is she, is she, is he there with you? Did he see who you stabbed? What's going on? I don't understand what's nope. going on. He yep, found the knife, too. He found the knife. Did he get stabbed? Did you see yeah. him? They're going to come and kill me. Yes, I did it. Because I'm fed up with life and I want to die. I'm ready to kill. The call ends abruptly. Meanwhile, at the Verkirke home, blood was flowing out of the five stab wounds in Connor's back. Blood was also coming out of his mouth. Jared and Danny tried desperately to stop the bleeding. By the time the ambulance arrived, Connor's breath was very shallow. Paramedics knew that he was slipping away. He had lost a lot of blood. They rushed him to the hospital where he later died from his injuries. During the autopsy, it was discovered that two of the stab wounds penetrated Connor's lung. Glenn Stacy, the man who had let Jamarian use his phone, waited with Jamarian for the police to arrive. He said Jamarian told him he was upset because nobody loved him. It devastates me because I used to work with the youth, so my heart really goes out to this kid and his victim. 
When the police arrived, Jamarian cooperated with them and they took him into custody. During booking, the child showed the officers who were processing him the bruises on his chest and stomach that he stated he received when his stepfather punched him repeatedly. Connor was the oldest of four boys in the Verkirky home. He was an excellent big brother who always looked out for his younger siblings. He was a happy child who loved to make others laugh. He had many friends at school who miss him and want him to come back and play with them again, although they know that's not possible. Connor had blonde hair, blue eyes, freckles on his nose, and a smile that lit up the room. Connor's parents struggled to wrap their heads around what had just happened. They were told that the boy who stabbed their son to death was in police custody. They also found out that the Lawhorn family didn't have much food or money. Danny, Jared, and Jared's mom's hearts broke for the boy's parents. They decided that they wanted to help, so they took $150 out of the ATM and went to Jamarian's house. They gave the money to Anita Lawhorn, Jamarian's mother, because according to Jared, that's how we were raised. While investigating the case, the police in Kentwood discovered a Child Protective Services file dated May of 2013, a year and three months prior to the stabbing. On that day, CPS caseworkers were called to the school that Jamarian was attending. He was afraid to tell them about the beatings that he had received because his mother had warned him not to tell people at school about what happened at home. The child could barely sit down, though, and eventually told CPS caseworkers that his mother had beaten him with a belt on a regular basis. He then showed the caseworker the bruises and scars on the back of his legs and buttocks. He also stated that Bernard Harold, Anita's boyfriend, often punched him and beat him with an extension cord. Some of the scars are so bad that they are permanent. When the CPS worker visited the home, which Jamarian lived in with one older sibling and two younger siblings, she found deplorable living conditions. There were mouse droppings and roaches running rampant. Beer cans and drug paraphernalia littered the living room. Piles of dirty laundry were in the kids' rooms. There was very little food in the kitchen for the children to eat. The CPS caseworker filled out a report and shoved it in a filing cabinet. They took no further action. CPS policy and Michigan Child Protection Law both require that a CPS worker notify the police and the county prosecutor within 24 hours of discovering criminal child abuse. Neither were notified. Police visited the Lawhorn home during the murder investigation and found that not much had changed since the CPS investigation. They stated that the living conditions in the home were unbearable. There were flies all around. There were signs of drug abuse and empty beer cans scattered about. There were no sheets or blankets on the beds, but the beds were covered with bugs. There were no working utilities. The house was in disrepair with drywall falling in the bathroom. What little food was in the house was moldy, rotten, or otherwise inedible. On October 2, 2014, the court removed Jamarian's 14-year-old brother, 7-year-old sister, and 2-year-old sister from the home and placed them with relatives. Anita and Bernard were given supervised visitation. As the police dug deeper into Anita, they discovered that she had two children in New York who were removed from her care before Jamarian was born. A one-year-old girl had multiple broken bones and a three-year-old girl had cigarette burns on her body. Jamarian's father was still in New York, and after the CPS investigation in May 2013, Jamarian was sent to New York to live with his father. His father was on parole for second-degree assault and third-degree menacing. There, Jamarian was abused by his father and his grandmother. His father knocked him around while his grandmother beat him with a sandal. He lived there for a year and then was sent back to Anita. There is no explanation as to why he was sent back. As time went on, Jared and Danny discovered more about Jamarian's background. Their feelings toward Jamarian are positive one day and negative the next. This is Jared and Danny in an interview with Wood TV 8 about a month after their son's murder. Instead of crying out for help or something like that, he chose to act violently 
Which in itself was probably a very, very loud cry for help. A month later, Connor's mom and dad are at times numb. Tears come some days, but not others. Anger wells, then fades, and turns sometimes to pity, at least for Jamarian. It is. It's a roller coaster. It's a complete roller coaster. You know, today I might feel bad for him. Tomorrow I might hate him. But there's no wavering in their anger at Jamarian's mom. After the stabbing, CPS took away her other three kids and filed papers to terminate her parental rights. Connor's parents said they believed those kids were already gone when they gave Anita Lawhorn the money for groceries. Uh, we went there and gave her money with the uh, with the intent that it would be used for good purposes. If she didn't use it for that, that's on her. Where are you afraid it went? Uh, Up her nose. For a year after the murder, Jamarian was held in a juvenile detention facility. He was taken to an inpatient pediatric psychiatric center a few times after suicide attempts. After about six months of counseling, he stopped trying to commit suicide. In December 2014, Jamarian was in court to determine if he was competent to stand trial. Psychologists from both sides examined him and testified. As expected, the psychologist for the prosecution testified that he was most definitely competent, and the psychologist for the defense stated that he was not. The criteria for competency is that the accused understands the charges against him and can assist in his own defense. The psychologist for the defense stated that no child at the age of 12 can understand the charges against him because he has no comprehension of the long-term effects and consequences. The court disagreed with her and ruled that Jamarian was competent to stand trial as an adult. The trial began in September 2015. The case was cut and dry. There was no question about who did it. The defense pled insanity, but the prosecution disagreed. Jamarian had told one of his counselors that he had been contemplating it since CPS did nothing about the abuse he had reported. He didn't decide exactly on how, when, or who his victim would be, but the homicidal and suicidal thoughts had been present for over a year. The jury determined that because the murder was premeditated, even though the details were not, Jamarian was guilty of first-degree murder. In Michigan, the judge has three sentencing options. One, he can deliver an adult sentence, meaning that other than normal appeals and parole considerations, the sentence will be set in stone and Jamarian would be remanded to the Michigan Department of Corrections immediately. Two, he can deliver a juvenile sentence, meaning that Jamarian will serve time in juvie until he's 21, at which time he'll be released free and clear. Or three, he can issue a blended sentence, which means the judge would impose an adult sentence However, Jamarian would be considered on probation in juvenile detention center and receive the benefits of GV, such as counseling and rehabilitation programs. The case would be reviewed regularly. Many factors determine at which age sentencing would be reconsidered. At that time, the judge will review the case as well as Jamarian's cooperation and improvement. The judge may set Jamarian free, sentence him to 25 to 40 years, impose life with the possibility of parole after 60 years, or life without parole. The prosecution argued that if Jamarian is given a straight juvenile sentence, he will serve a maximum of eight years. The question is, will he be able to be rehabilitated by then? That's something we just don't know. She didn't think it would be wise on the court's part to tie their own hands that way. She said that she isn't opposed to a blended sentence. The defense said, is it fair for the future to be hung over Jamarian's head for the next eight years? He deserves to know what the future holds for him. He also presented the argument that Jamarian tried many ways to get help and nothing else worked. He said, some of the culpability for this matter doesn't rest on Jamarian. It rests on the people who are supposed to be taking care of him. I'm talking about his parents. I'm talking about the authorities that were contacted. It doesn't remove responsibility from Jamarian, but Jamarian, in a way, is a victim as well. Jamarian has cooperated with his counselors in juvie and has improved in the last year and three months since the murder. 
Based on that, as well as the vast resources available in the juvenile system, he thinks Jamarian is capable of being rehabilitated. The focus has been primarily on Jamarian. I felt that it was very important to play a clip of the actual victim impact statements. We cannot forget Connor in all of this. During the statements, Anita was crying, but Jamarian showed no emotion. Um, it probably goes without saying that losing Connor has caused irrevocable pain. Um, I carry it every day and I miss him every day. This past year, I watched as my son, who prior to losing Connor, brought home straight A pluses all across the board, dropped down to C's and D minuses. His grades are back up, um, but there are several studies that I have read about what happens to young children who are exposed to severe act of acts of violence. And uh, these, along with my own grief, keeps me up every night. Um, I feel like I constantly exist in two worlds, this one and one where Connor is still here. Not a day goes by that I don't imagine what he would be doing, wearing, what clever jokes he would make that would cause me to laugh. You know, I picture him sitting in that chair if he had been able to live through it, but he's not there. Um, I don't often address this, and I had to step out, so I'm not even sure if it was brought up or not. Um, but I myself experienced abuse growing up, and after I moved out just before I was 19 years old, not very many people knew about it, even inside of my own home. Um, and when I found out that I was pregnant with Connor, I began researching how to break the cycle, how to be a better parent. I took classes because I never wanted any of my children to feel the way that I felt or to be touched by that. Um, so the notion that he should possibly receive a lesser sentence or, any, or you know, not as much time based on his home circumstances um, hurts because of my own history and I feel like it adds to the stigma of people who have been abused or have mental illness and it would be doing us a disservice. Um, financially, this has caused a big mess. We have spent over $2,500 out of pocket on therapy over the last year. And Cameron will be in and out of therapy well into adulthood because as he grows up and as his brain matures, he is going to have to constantly reprocess what happened. Um, just all around, this has been completely devastating. And I just wanted to say that I firmly believe in the saying that grieving the loss of a child is a process and it begins on the day that your child passes and ends the day the parent joins them. So. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah. Yes, Your Good. I remember seeing you with the drive. What would you like to say? Um, the way this has affected my life is it's hard to make friends and sometimes it makes it, um, and sometimes when I wake up, I wonder where my brother Connor is and I remember that it wasn't, was the opposite of a dream. And sometimes it's hard to make friends because they might be like um, Jamarian. And I miss Connor, like how he used to, how he was funny. He is the funniest kid I ever. I love how he would spend time with me. Um, Jamari lied and killed my older brother. What does that say? Okay. Connor was a, was my first best friend and is it? Oh, I will miss him forever.
To say my son's death hit us like a wrecking ball feels like an understatement. It has wrapped its ugly hand around every part of my, of my life. Still to this day, I, I am a shell of who I once was. I'm a shell of the man I was on August 3rd, 2014. That is the last full day where my family was whole. That was my seventh wedding anniversary, and we went on a family swimming trip. And now every day I relive the horror of the next day, August 4th. There are no words to explain holding my dying son in my arms, no way to count the trauma of his brothers watching him die. These are the last living memories I have of my son. These scenes replay in my head and make the horror movie seem like a docile, docile by comparison. I say this all not to gain sympathy, but to begin to paint an explanation for what this has done to us. I love my son and I, and not a second goes by, sleeping or awake, that I do not miss him and agonize for what happened to him. Thank you very much, folks. It's important for all of us to hear the remarks. Jamarian also had the opportunity to speak. He read the following off of a paper he had written. I'm sorry for my actions. I have been going through lots of things during that month. Every night I have cried for all the pain I have caused throughout the whole process. I have, I have had days without eating because of what had happened. If I could go back, I would stop myself. I now realize the nightmare that you and I have to live with. I don't show any emotion because if I do, I will not stop crying. After the day, I was convicted. I did not know how to handle it. All I did was tell myself it was not tonight. I, it was all over and I could never live a normal life. People think I'm crazy, but they don't know what, they do not know me. If I could go back, I would take all the pain and stress rather than take a life. And I really don't understand none of this. I just try to, but I really don't and do not like what I did and neither do you. And I know what I did was wrong. I just do not understand why I did it. I made a terrible mistake. I just want you to know that I am sorry for all the pain you, you, you have been going through. And when I get older, I will help kids not to make the mistake I made and help them become a better person in life so they, so they will not have to suffer the abuse I had to suffer on that day. I was so scared, I was afraid. My stepfather, was afraid of my stepfather. I wanted to die because I thought there was no way out. I, I, I now know hurting someone was not right, was not the right answer. I have been talking to a pastor and asked him to talk to the kids in the detention center so he can help them how he was helping me. I'm sorry for what I did. I just wanted to, you to know that. I just wanted you to know that. The judge mentioned that prior to the murder, Jamarian had gotten into some fights, but none of a serious nature, had been suspended from school on more than one occasion, and had stolen something. There are less detailed accounts, according to Anita, that he may have committed an arson at the home and possibly abused an animal at some point. The judge went on to say that the probation officer reported that Jamarian has shown growth and maturity. This is a quote from the judge during sentencing. While his violent upbringing is not a viable excuse to murder, Jamarian was 12 years old when he committed this killing, and it would be naive to conclude that his life experience had nothing to do with his scheme of killing someone so that he would be arrested and executed. The judge issued a blended sentence. Technically speaking, Jamarian will be on probation with the terms being that he will be in juvenile detention center, required to attend schooling and acquire his high school diploma, attend counseling, and whatever else his probation officer recommends. If he can abide by the rules and prove to the court that he is capable of turning his life around, that will be considered as well. He will appear for a number of review hearings at which time the case will be reviewed. If Jamarian has violated the terms of his probation in any way, an adult sentence will be imposed immediately. The juvenile facility that Jamarian was sent to has intense programs set up for murderers. 
It includes schooling, counseling, and positive reinforcement. It will provide the adequate punishment as well as the opportunity for Jamarian to grow and mature and further understand the damage that he has done through his actions. After the remaining three children were removed from the home, Anita and Bernard began taking parenting classes and drug abuse counseling. They did very well. The judge in that case said in reference to their progress in January 2015 that he was genuinely impressed and that he thinks they're off to a good start. In November 2015, just two months after Jamarian was convicted of first-degree murder, his mother and her boyfriend faced charges for third-degree child abuse. They were both convicted and sentenced to one year in prison and five years probation. However, since they had three other children at home, the judge ordered Anita to serve 150 days in the Count County Jail. Two weeks after she was released, Bernard was to report to the jail to serve his 150 days. The judge felt that it was best that they take turns so that the other parent could care for the three children. The citizens of Kent County were outraged that CPS did nothing. CPS states that they did nothing wrong. Since Anita sent Jamarian to live with his father in New York, the child was no longer in a dangerous situation, nor was he even in the state of Michigan. They say that it was the parents' responsibility to inform them when Jamarian returned to Kent County. The other three children were not removed from the home at that time. The CPS caseworker did not follow CPS policy and the child protection law that requires them to report their findings to the police and the district attorney. The Verkirkis want to know why no one was held accountable. Why do they get to act outside of those laws? Why do they get to be outside of those restrictions? Is it because of their caseloads? Is it because they're in some position of power that they feel that they don't? It's their discretion which rules that they follow? It's not, and it's not. You don't get to pick and choose. It does feel like, you know, somebody else not doing their job properly cost me dearly. In April 2016, a CPS investigator and a supervisor were disciplined for the actions they took or failed to take in May of 2013. They were given a five-day suspension without pay and assigned to receive more training. As a result of this case, other changes have been made to CPS protocols, but I couldn't find any details on what those specific changes were. Connor's grandmother continues to help Anita financially and by providing transportation to visit with Jamarion in Juvie. She said, When I found out about her and that she was a drug addict, I thought, why am I helping? Did she do drugs with the money we gave her for groceries? But I didn't allow myself to dwell on that. No matter what she did, I knew I needed to see her through eyes of compassion and love. Why does our human nature allow us to decide that only some people are worthy of love and compassion? Jamarian is doing well. He's following the rules, hasn't gotten into any trouble, and is getting good grades. He has been working with a pastor to help other kids make better decisions than he made. He hopes to be released and become a writer and a motivational speaker when he grows up. What do you think? Was the blended sentence the best thing for everyone involved? Do you think CPS should have faced more consequences? If so, what would be appropriate? You can give us your thoughts and feedback by going to MinorMurderers.com and looking for our forum or our social media links or our phone number where you can call and leave a voicemail. We received another voicemail that we'd like to share. This is Angie from White House, Tennessee. I did not know any details about the Centoya Brown murder. I caught bits and pieces from various friends on Facebook, but never really had a good clear picture of what all was involved in the case. I have to say, I was completely riveted by the podcast. I actually listened the whole way through and found out things I never knew. We really appreciate that review, Angie. 
Thank you all so much for listening to Minor Murderers, Children Who Kill. Join us April 1st when we release Episode 3. We will be covering the case of Sheila Eddy and Rachel Schoaf. Their victim was their friend Skylar Niece. All three were 16 years old.